Good evening. Tonight I'm going to talk very much about something which perhaps as an environmental group or interested parties in nature, you never thought you'd be listening to. It's all about banking, about finance and so on. But what I hope at the end of this uh, lecture, in 50 minutes time, you'll understand why we need to start asking questions about our financial systems. Because at the end of the day, they're going to be fundamental questions that we need to ask not only of ourselves, but are all, also of the whole society. One of the things we have to recognize is that we don't know precisely how countries are going to tra tackle these triple crises of global recession, climate change, and in effect that widening set of inequalities that we've seen emerge during the COVID pandemic. Each one of them is a systematic issue, and it's a crisis in its own right, but together they kind of form the perfect storm of cascading threats. What we do know is that policymakers everywhere are going to have a choice. They can continue with the centuries-old ideas of making small incremental changes, superficial reforms, and these really fail to address or engage with the underlying problems. Or they can seize the opportunity to adopt a radically different approach, collectively reimagining the foundations of our economies. What they need to do then is to recognize that prosperity isn't just about economic growth. It's also about ensuring that people are living prosperous, fulfilling lives, and that at the same time, we are investing in the sustainable health of our planet. So in this lecture, what I want to do is to look at how we can create more successful ways to live ourselves, but also how we can create those opportunities to flourish through increased well-being, but a principle where investment in nature is the norm. It's no longer something rather specialised that environmental groups do, and how it's then used to underpin sustainable and inclusive economic growth. Some of the outcomes that we should be interested in when we're reading the newspapers and literally kind of engaging online with people is things like biodiversity net gain, natural prosperity and resilient places, a just transition to net zero, not just about getting to net zero for emissions, but doing it in a just way, and inclusive economies, whether they're green or blue. And I think generally, I hope that by the end of this lecture, you're going to see that it's really important in delivering these that we look at the type of fiscal policies, the kinds of financial instruments that are out there. And with that, the new kinds of decision making processes that are going to be needed. We often refer back to the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. It was decided in 2015. It was called The Future We Want. Little did we know, of course, that five years later, we would have a very, very stark decision put before us. What was clear, though, at that time, was that climate change, biodiversity loss, and social inequality all needed to be addressed urgently. But since then, of course, the COVID pandemic has exposed just how much these aspects are in intertwined. And more importantly, whilst investors have previously been focusing on climate change and the climate crisis, which is, in fact, one of the planet's gravest problems, but now they're becoming increasingly concerned about the significant financial liabilities and risks stemming from biodiversity loss and the destruction of natural ecosystems. In fact, if we look at the damage to ecosystems, whether it's forests or grasslands, coral reefs, and all of that associated loss of biodiversity, we think now that it could drain nearly $10 trillion from the global economy by 2050. Now, a, late, a recent report by the World uh, Worldwide Fund for Nature estimates that these losses not only come from the usual uh, suspects like reduced crop yields, fish catches, and exposure to floods and other natural disasters, but also there's a whole variety of intangible market costs. If we think about one focused area, let's say plastics, some of the most recent analyses have shown that um, that loss of the benefits that coral reefs and marine uh, ecosystems provide for us are literally um, on a knife edge. So the, the calculation, without even taking health into account, is somewhere between $3,300 up to $33,000 per tonne. Now, we've got 75, maybe even as much as 150 million metric tonnes of plastics in the oceans. That was sort of eight, nine years ago, and we're still coming up with new estimates. 
This amounts to a, a loss that could be somewhere up to $2,500 billion. That's just in the lost services that those ecosystems can provide. So when we start to think even more in detail about, about what that looks like, we find examples that are really quite stark. So for example, when we see that uh, plastics can transport different kind of invasive species around the world, there is one in particular, a pathogen, it's an invasive species and it attacks the skeleton of coral reefs. And when that happens, uh, and when it kind of gets dispersed in this way, we now estimate that the cost of just that pathogen is $272 billion globally. So what you begin to understand is that our interventions can be seen as rather minimal in size of what, in, in compared to the size of the problem. Now, WWF, in their report, created something called a global conservation scenario. And what they were saying is that, let's imagine that the world adopts a more sustainable pathway and we invest in it and we look after ecosystem services. What they consider, even under the best scenario, is that the GDP would be slightly higher, maybe $11 billion by 2050, so rather conservative, nevertheless a gain. But what happens is that these small estimates are just because we've put an enormous effort into protecting ourselves against the loss of just a few ecosystem services. But imagine that we don't even take into account in that tipping points where ecosystems have gone to the edge and thresholds have been expanded over and essentially you see the collapse. You see uh, fires spreading, you see drought in savannas, um, everything becomes more vulnerable and catastrophic. So effectively, taking a sort of least damage approach, even that is going to really impact us. Now, we know these vulnerabilities. There have been fantastic reports put out by um, international government bodies, the science body called IPBES. They've warned about the current levels of ambition falling far short of what we need to do. So in the end, reading all of these reports, we come to the idea that what we need is essentially a new deal for nature and people together to reverse the loss of biodiversity. In other words, we need to put nature on a path for recovery to benefit everyone, both people and the planet, before it is too late. Now, in an, impact, in an impacted world, we can see all kinds of reasons why this happens. It's not so difficult. Uh, in a healthy biosphere over many, many millennia, we've been able to see that humans could draw down the goods and services that nature provides, um, not only for consumption, but also to invest, to accumulate produced capital, as we might call it. They could be roads, buildings, all kinds of things. They could also be used to invest in human capital, so health, education, aptitude. And in a sense, nature was driving the economy. It was making all of this possible. And we've been doing this for millennia, and it's been a very legitimate model for development. So, for example, we sometimes call this ecological footprint the hallmark of how we have utilised nature. However, as you can see in this little diagram, if you get it wrong, and essentially that balance is incorrect, then you very quickly run into trouble. So we're in a very different situation now. In other words, demand, measured as the human population, and our activity per capita, even if you do, and divided by efficiency, that's in other words how nature is converted into something rather crude, like the gross domestic product, and how it gets transformed by waste, is larger than supply. And that's where we are today. Now, a very important report has been brought out by Parthadas Gupta, brought out earlier this year. And he essentially looked at the economics of biodiversity. And he defines this impact inequality as that essential problem of where demand has completely outstripped supply. And it stands in very stark contrast to how we've been working in the past, which is somehow that technology advances would respond and we would actually be able to overcome some of that shortfall. But what his report shows, the reality is that even if the global population size remained constant and the deterioration of nature was really constrained to almost nothing per year, like 0.1%, there would still be a need for a 60% increase in the efficiency with which nature is converted into GDP. So this is incredibly unlikely. In other words, 
increases in efficiency alone are just not going to be able to close the gap between the human impact and nature's regenerative capacity. But neither is perpetual economic growth possible in the long run, given the model that we have. So we're really failing to sustain nature, and the demands far exceed the supply. If we just uh, sort of stand back and look at the, the numbers, they're very, very stark. We can see that human capital has increased about 10%. The, per capita, uh, uh, the capital produced per person has doubled, but the stock of natural capital has actually declined by nearly 40%. So everything is going in the wrong direction. Now, it's not just about today. We're actually endangering our prosperity for future generations. And, and this is not something trivial. This is genuinely the case. It's not about there's a limited planet and only some of us have access to it even those who are in the most developed part of the world, using resources essentially as if they were unlimited, is it, we're effectively shooting ourselves in the foot. And this is because the current rates of biodiversity decline are faster than we have ever seen in all of recorded history. Now, what COVID-19 has shown us is that the way we go about managing the planet and using resources is sort of doubly defective we're rapacious in our use of resources, but we're also careless in the way we use resources, connecting things, creating connections which weren't there before. And in a sense, what COVID has shown us is that we could be at the beginning of a downward spiral of sort of tipping points and thresholds being crossed, where we literally could not stop it even if we wanted to. So how can we change this sort of impact inequality as as uh, Lord Dasgupta has told us, into an impact equality. What he thinks is that there are several avenues. Well, first of all, rather the simplest one, is to reduce per capita global consumption. Everyone should essentially use less. There is, of course, always the tenet that lowering the global population from today's level is an avenue that one could follow. Um, you could also imagine increasing efficiency, but as I said, not likely that to, to be able to match the kind of demand that we're putting onto nature and all of the goods and services. And so we come to the last point, and this is the one that really I want to talk about for the rest of the lecture, and it's about investing in nature. Through conservation, of course, restoration, and in a sense, encouraging regeneration. That regenerative rate is what we need to really think about. And I really do believe that the last, this one, this investment in nature, is not only urgent, but potentially we could turn the corner. We could have the greatest off uh, impact in offsetting the damage that we currently are doing to nature. In other words, we're going to use the global wealth to create alternative pathways for managing land and oceans. Now, when I talk about the global wealth, I actually mean your wealth. I mean your life. It may be that you have very modest savings, or maybe you haven't been able to save anything at all. But essentially, everything that we are contributing, either to our society, to our families, um, to people around us, that is our wealth. And imagine that we use the power of that wealth when it comes, let's say, from pension funds or wherever, but we use that to drive a deeper understanding across the whole of society that investing in nature is essentially akin to investing in ourselves. Because that is really what it is. It's ourselves today and our future selves and in fact, our well-being is really what this is all about. And if we don't do that, we should consider that damaging nature is directly damaging ourselves. So how do we do that? Well, fortunately, there are some moves afoot. But we need to pay attention to what they are, because they're not easy. They're really complicated. And I'm going to try to sort of step us through some of the things that you might be interested in. Now, some of them are rather arcane, some of them are very interesting, but let's hope the whole package gives something of interest to some of you. So the main obstacle is that we have institutions that are failing us. They really haven't recognised the true value of nature in all the goods and services that we are buying in our everyday. It's just not reflected in the market price. And why is that? Well, it's because nature comes along in three different ways. It's silent, it's invisible, and it's mobile. And this means that negative effects on much of nature have gone unnoticed. So we have this proposed uh, problem, which is called 
creating externalities. So when we do damage, we somehow put it to one side and someone else will deal with it. We think it's an external part of the problem. But in fact, it isn't. And if we don't bring those externalities back into the marketplace, the market won't function well. As a result of that, we have massive underinvestment in nature. Because if you don't notice that something's going wrong, well, you're not going to invest in actually fixing it. But when we think about nature as our most precious asset, it's much more than an economic good. In fact, its existence is, is uh, imperative to all of us, and it has intrinsic worth, not only just to indigenous peoples, but to all of us. And there have been many economists that have pointed this out. Um, Parta das Gupta, as I mentioned, Herman Daly back in the 90s, Robert Costanza, and big initiatives like TEEB, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, and the Capital Coalitions. So all around the world, maybe eating away at the edges, we've got initiatives, programs, groups, companies, um, governments, all trying out different methods and frameworks to see if it's possible to value ecosystems and biodiversity. Now, you may have read um, about payment for ecosystem services. Some people find that this is rather difficult to sort of take on board because it, it sort of puts a monetary value on nature. But fundamentally, if we don't do this in one way or another, then we will not get the capacity to invest in nature in the future because it will have gone. Um, so during this year, a lot of political leaders and thinking uh, and negotiators and others are coming together to discuss global policies on how to take care of nature, but how to bring nature, climate and development all together. The kinds of things we'll be valuing nature, payment for ecosystem services, and more importantly, the alignment of financial institutions, banks, insurance companies, investors, with investments in nature. Now, what's been used in the past is this term payment for ecosystem services. And it's, on the whole, been used by developed and richer countries to pay poorer nations to protect globally important ecosystems especially those that lie within their territories. So it could be the Ghats in India, it could be the Amazon. And this is a very uh, iconic ecosystem because many of us know how much the planet relies on the Amazon and the Amazon forest. So this track record has been there and it's been dressed up in different ways. It could be a direct development payment. It could be to secure carbon sinks, uh, to finance sustainable development to deal with climate change, so a whole variety of reasons as to why different countries, rich countries, have invested. And in a sense, I won't say it's always the case, but it's a bit like paying guilt money. So a lot of developed countries feel that you know, they've used up the world's resources, and this is part of balancing the scales of climate justice. But in the extreme, it can actually lead to an abnegation of responsibilities. And a case in point is what's happening in the Amazon rainforest within the borders of Brazil. Now, after more than two years denying that runaway deforestation in the Amazon was a real problem, the president, Jair Bolsonaro, his minister asserted that the country would cut deforestation by up to 40% in one year in exchange for $1 billion. Now, it's sort of like blackmail. We'll do the right thing if you pay us to do it. But in the country, Brazilian legislators, governors, and civil society groups point out that there are a number of reasons to be wary about negotiating in this way, because for one thing, the administration is hostile, and it's, it's purportedly and absolutely clearly written out, and in many statements, it's hostile to conservation efforts. So when the previous president was joining the Paris Climate Agreement, Brazil committed itself to ending illegal deforestation by 2030. But the current administration uh, gave a tacit promise to relax uh, enforcement of all that strict environmental legislation. And deforestation now is at its highest rate since 2008. In other words, when we, present, when we see the case presented for Brazil, it's as it was almost half a decade ago. So it's not clear, in a sense, how money can help accomplish this complete shift and volta facie. In fact, the Norwegian minister um, stated publicly that decreasing deforestation in the short term is a matter of political will, not a lack of advance funding and financing. 
So why do I think it's worth saying it? Well, it's because Norway has poured more than $1.2 billion into the Amazon Fund, which pays Brazil to protect the rainforest. So it knows better than any that Brazil has the technical ability, has the institutions to rein in deforestation if it wants to. IMPE is a very famous space research centre, and it has the best tools in the world to monitor what is happening on the ground. So this is really crucial for policy planning, but also for the rest of the world to see. In 2006, this same agency was able to define a whole area, about 150 million acres, that were going to be put to one side, it's like the size of France, and they at that time cracked down and had raids and, and essentially tried to stop illegal deforestation. But since then, all of that has gone by the board. So we know that there is a big difference between the capacity and the will, and that money sometimes doesn't do it. Nevertheless, as we consider moving forward, we know that we have to design solutions that will create um, fundamental tenets that could make sure that ensuring demands on nature do not exceed supply, that investments in nature increase the supply above the current levels. We do need to use economic success uh, measures of that to basically put nature into social and financial decision-making processes. But most critically, it's about transforming institutions and systems. And with that, I mean finance and education, because without those, you won't be able to confront and to reverse the kinds of changes that some political regimes put in place. So here really comes the nub. When we look at institutions around the world, a major issue is how unfit many of them are in terms of managing both externalities but also the natural world that they have within their borders. We can see government after government after government putting subsidies towards industries and individuals to exploit nature rather than protect it, to allow it to be essentially degraded and run down. What we think is that, well, as a conservative level, that the total cost globally of subsidies that damage nature is approximately between four and six trillion dollars a year. In other words, on the one hand, we're having global agreements about conservation, stopping biodiversity loss, and literally at the same time, we're spending four to six trillion dollars a year encouraging the degradation and the overuse of those resources. So it's a nonsense, really. And this is one of the things that really we have to challenge and to bring all of that onto the table and have those numbers in front of us. So imagine a different world, a different scenario where let's go out into the oceans, into the open seas, and we say, well, if you're going to use the open oceans, which belong to all of us, it's a global common good, actually you've got to pay a fee you effectively have to create a revenue stream. And those revenues actually could pay for a system of international governance for what currently now is a sort of free for all because it's beyond national borders. So essentially, we're looking at a totally different way in which institutions would work. We would call it um, like an ecosystem. It's polycentric. It's got many places all having to interact together. Collaborations, participation. Essentially looking after the local but paying attention at the global. And that collaborative work of participation, coordination, allows us to get early signals where perhaps ecosystems are going towards tipping points and bring in emergency funds to avoid that. But, and I have to say this again, institutions are not enough. If you really want to curb excesses, you actually have to go to the core of the problem. And ultimately, the problem is every single individual's whether you're rich or poor, we have to think about a societal change, one that really confronts the idea that many people who live in cities have become distant from nature. I mean, I have a, a huge opportunity because I live um, with a Maasai in, in the bush and I see what it means to be living in nature. But at the same time, I recognise that many of us living in urban areas at the same time Perhaps a tree or a bird is the nearest one gets to nature. So it's difficult to bring that and the value of nature into everyday life. Nevertheless, that's what we have to do. And that's why education, 
developing education programs that bring home just how fragile our life on planet is and why we have to invest in nature if we're going to see ourselves through to, well, let's say, to the next two, three, four, five generations. But having got that societal thinking, we then need to use, so to speak, the juggernaut of finances. Because if you think about how governments operate, it's mostly because of the financial issues. So if you have got your funds in a, in a pension fund, you should be insisting to look and see, well, what's happening to those funds? Are you investing in nature? Nature won't let us down. That's the crucial point. If we invest in nature, its ability to regenerate and come back and sustain us is always there. It's like the forever forgiving parent. It will come back, but we have to invest in it. And so when we're thinking about going forward from a simple scheme like just paying for an ecosystem service, we need to think about a totally different financial strategy, a green financial strategy, which has got planning and future strategies for humankind at its core. Now, a lot is said about it, and some, you know, many, many words are said. There are multilateral agreements. We control chemicals. We do many things. You know, we stop and we, we, we um, uh, ban things. For example, the UK has banned microbeads. We've introduced a charge for plastic bags. Other countries have gone much further. Um, they've banned a whole variety of single-use plastics. So everybody's on the bandwagon of plastics. We're going to ban this, stop this, and stop that. But actually, all of these are just touching, they're like touching at the edges of why do we have so many plastics in our communities, in our life, in our world. If you think about it, back up to what I said, fracking has released an enormously cheap fossil fuel, which is going to go into a chemicals industry, which is going to generate, as we understand it, trillions and trillions of dollars worth of poly, essentially the, the raw materials, the feedstocks which go into plastics. That's just doesn't make sense if at the other end we're trying to clean up the oceans where all of these plastics are running in and now ending up in the human food chain. So we need a whole of society approach. What's interesting is what's happening in the UK. And this is not alone. Australia is on the same way and many other countries. But let me highlight, because we're here in the UK, and it's probably interesting because you must have heard on the radio something called ELMS, the Environment Land Management. And if you listen to the farming today in the mornings on the radio, you'll, you'll see that there's a lot of anticipation, anxiety, and so forth. So in leaving the European Union, the, the government had to, in a sense, recognise that the common agricultural policy, the common fisheries policy, had really been the underpinning for many farmers and fishermen, fishing enterprises, to keep them going. And now we need a transition towards placing nature at the core of our economy. So we have to enshrine it in law. And a first step, along, along a very long path, I have to tell you, is a green future, our 25-year plan to improve the environment. So there it is, it's on the table. And it comes along with the green, clean growth strategy and our industrial strategy. So the attempt from the Environment Plan is to set out a comprehensive set of long-term actions to protect and enhance the environment for the next generation. And we have to deliver many things, clean growth to combat global warming, to reverse the biodiversity loss. So many things, creating new habitats, um, helping, the helping to stop the decline of native species, uh, minimizing pollution, especially for chemicals and plastics. Most importantly, though, connecting people to the environment to promote greater well-being. So there is enshrined in the environment plan this understanding that connecting people will help to deliver change. We also need to incentivize people who've got land, who have responsibilities, to step up and change the ways in which they undertake their economic activities. So there are some metrics, there are some principles. The polluter pays principle. You know, you pollute, you pay for cleanup. Precautionary principle. We don't quite know enough. We're going to keep on investigating, but until we know better, we're going to stop doing something. Um, or environmental net gain. In other words, an overall positive picture. The problem is that right now we don't have any principles governing the valuation and this payment for public goods. But we need it. So we need to understand how to create the financial instruments that will allow us to balance the public goods and private benefit. Now, farmers 
have really sort of had to step up. We have three schemes, and they're going to reward good environmental land management. So the first one is sustaining sustainable farming incentives, local nature recovery, and landscape recovery. The local one, of course, is very much around local uh, initiatives, local priorities, a lot of collaboration between farmers working in the local environment. That gets launched in 2024. Landscape recovery, slightly bigger scale. So here we're looking at how ecosystems are operating, long-term projects, um, restoring wildlife, wilder landscapes, and so on. Again, large-scale tree planting, recovering uh, peatlands and salt marshes. So this is really investing in nature. Now, the sums of money are way too small. Nevertheless, there is a legal basis upon which this work can be done. That, again, starts in 2024. More immediately, though, is, of course, we have to help farmers make the transition between where they were under the European system and where they are today. So the farmers are now fully engaged in trying to figure this out with, with DEFRA. This is the, the department in the United Kingdom that deals with farming and agriculture. So the incentive scheme has got lots of pilots. We've got 2,000 farmers engaged in these live tests and trials looking at is it a good idea to have a plan, number one? Well, 85% of the farmers agree it's a good idea to have a plan. But there's no consensus on how you certify it, um, how you balance the practicality of delivering public goods with food production and business profitability. So again, it's where does the value lie? Who's going to pay for those public services? How do we invest in nature if the very groups who are going to have to manage it are not going to be properly um, sort of um, uh, monetized. So how, how are they going to be uh, rewarded? There's also a big problem, which is all of this in our world needs to be monitored. We need to gather evidence. Um, so it's all very well saying, you know, I'm going to take on a commitment to do X, Y, and Z. But if you can't go back and prove that you've done it, well, even, even those of us who are very positive and, and think about this as a great opportunity would actually like to see that the outcomes are really being met. And what farmers and many landowners would say that in the past, the payment process was very much income foregone plus costs. But the problem is it doesn't really provide a really good incentive for farmers to join a scheme. So we have to think about very different ways of incentivizing them. And so all these tests and trials which are going on are really trying to think of the best way. Right now, they're thinking about some deferred payment based on an outcome, um, and to give you some idea, we had something called a countryside stewardship scheme. The payment ranges uh, were rather low. So, for example, if a farmer was planting out a hay meadow, they might be paid just over £300 per hectare. Farmers today are saying that to achieve what the real outcome is, it may have to go up to £650 per hectare. So, in other words, a proper valuation of what that will do for the whole of society. Similarly, trees. Under the previous schemes, maybe it was £8.50 per tree. A farmer's saying, well, actually, we need somewhere between £100 and £250 per tree because it's not just about planting it. You've got to go and take care of it. You've got to make sure it's alive, make sure the deer don't eat it, and many other things. So these are all really live issues, and they're fascinating. If we really want to make our contribution clear that we're going to invest in nature, we trust people to do it, but actually we want to take care that we're getting the right outcomes for the money that we're spending. Frequency of payments, there's all these operational issues. And of course, farmers will say, well, sometimes there's a massive storm comes, not much they can do about it. So we have to overcome all of those problems. But this is a very, very live debate. And it's really something that each one of us is personally uh, affected by. So this is not just something you may hear on the radio and turn off or read a short article in the paper. This is something which is going to affect our wealth, our future wealth. So undoubtedly, this is going to be an important scheme, but it's nowhere near the scale of what we need to do. What we really need to do is to change our financial systems. We need to transform those financial systems. Now, why now? Well, 10, 10 12 years ago, we had a financial crisis. We lost huge amounts of money, trillions of dollars were lost from the economy. We had all kinds of misaligned incentives. We had 
um, failures and accountability, failures of responsibility. I mean, in some cases, there was even um, sort of fiduciary duties were, were set to one side. So this is all happening as we go through and we discover at the end of the day. It's been going on below the radar. But what happened was the financial risk ran ahead of the world's ability to understand and manage it. And if I'm honest, we're in exactly the same position for the environment. The environmental risks are running ahead of us and we can barely understand what they are. We're just scratching at the surface. Researchers all over the world are trying to understand and unravel all of these different interconnections. So there's a grave similarity between what happened in the financial crisis and what is now happening in the sort of the triple helix of the climate, biodiversity loss and social inequality helix. So as these things are moving forward, they have financial materiality. And what we need to say is that they're going to come through as slow failures, kind of creeping risks, one disaster here, one storm here, one degraded land, one lost peat bog. It all starts to add up. And so the drivers that we see supposedly fixing this are actually creating a far more complex system than we can understand. So on one hand, we have a lot of regulations. We had a Habitats Directive. We've got all kinds of UK legislation and regulations on the books. But at the same time, we've got increasing disruptions in supply chains. We saw that happening during COVID, but it can happen again and again. And then we've got a lot of agitation in the world. We've got increased media attention. People are active. There's heightened sensitivities about consumers, what they can get hold of, and so on. And very unfortunately, when you look at the financial flows that are being affected by all these different uh, interactions, if you add it all up, literally the amount of money being invested in making sure that those natural assets are being taken care of is dwarfed by the subsidies and by all those other financial flows that are harming nature. So why now? Well, it's now or never, to be honest. So the left is about the financial crisis. What happened? But what we're seeing is that gradually people are putting their hands up. You know, actually, nature needs to be paid attention. I want to vote for nature. I really want to take care of the planet Earth, not because I'm a greenie or because I'm a conservationist, but actually I realise that my future is going to hang on this. This is really important. So when we're talking about the future of banking, we're actually talking about our future, how we invest our money, how we invest ourselves. There are many financial actors involved, but actually individuals are also financial actors, not just as consumers, but how we invest our time in the wealth around us. Now, the, world, the, sort of the role of the, the banking industry is without doubt under, underrated or, or maybe not truly clear. A lot of people in the street wouldn't know how much the banks have been doing, and they have. Um, but what they see often is that they're de-risking the world. So central banks insurers and others, they're making these decisions because they're trying to take risk out of the system. And historically, they've done that because of reputational risk. But now it's coming to the fact that we now need to have a whole of society risk put on the table. So nature is actually affecting corporate lending. But more importantly, it's really creating a new set of banking principles. So we've got good banks that are taking this very seriously. There's a group of them, uh, Rabobank and others. They're defining their own within the food and agribusiness, um, responsible natural resource management. Um, they can have different measures to stop land degradation, soil erosion, and so on. So these supply chain processes are becoming fundamental to essentially a set of principles for responsible banking. It's a new network. It has some very important parts to it. You might imagine that they'd been there all along, and they certainly were there in potential terms, fiduciary terms. But now we're saying we want to see them from an environmental perspective. So alignment, we want to know that you're not going to be subsidizing something at the same time as saying it's damaging the environment. You want to involve stakeholders. You want to make sure that clients and customers are fully aligned in what they think is actually happening with these investments. And so we can come along to a very simple idea, which is that Effectively, we should never have a balance sheet in a company or a bank or whatever which doesn't have nature in it. So, I, you know, no balance sheets without nature. 
So, you know, you're doing your financials. If you're running a business, you do the quarterly accounts. But the next sheet down is what we want to see now. This is the nature's balance sheet. How many resources are you using? What is your impact? Um, where are you getting your supplies from? What's the impact of your supply chain? Now, to help us, there's an entire industry out there. They are creating what are called accounting structures, nomenclatures, and taxonomies. These are not trivial. If I tell you that until recently, in the world of you know, economic activities, we had primarily, we had weavers and dyers, but we didn't have anything to do with green. Um, electric cars weren't even in the categories of vehicles. And you have to go quite a long way down in these nomenclatures, even down to level eight, an eight-digit level, to get to the point where an electric vehicle can be distinguished in the classification system. But the good news is it's actually there. So nomenclatures are important. We need to see the kinds of green products now appearing in these nomenclatures of economic activities. In addition, we also need to know that they're actually doing the job that they say they're doing, and that's why taxonomies are important. So they may sound rather arcane, but we need to ask. So you have a label, an eco-label. It says it's biodegradable. Well, is it? The work I've done on plastics tells me that there are many things called biodegradable, but unless they actually end up in an industrial composting, they're not going to degrade. A plastic bag out in the ocean could sit there for many, many, many years, slowly breaking down into microplastics. That's not biodegradability as we know it. So taxonomies are also important, and really consumers need to engage with this to say, well, actually, what does it mean? So nature's numbers, accounting, is not something you know, rather dusty and arcane. It's actually the lifeblood of how we're going to be able to understand and make visible the kind of finance that is going into the things that we want to see, the investments that we want to see in nature, so that we don't have greenwashing, that we can actually trace things back. And then a very nice emerging principle. Some banks very early on realised that you can buy bonds, sovereign bonds, various other things. So these are investments and they're issued by various parties. One or two banks, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development in particular, was a pioneer. They had social bonds and they were quite well accepted. So in other words, a project that does good on the ground socially. But then they brought out a green bond. And what these really point to is that when you say that you're going to have a green bond, it puts a lot of principles that promote the integrity into the marketplace. So there are guidelines around transparency, disclosure, all the things that I mentioned before about the banking principles. But now there's an extra layer. So when you are in the bond market, the green bond market, the, the use of the proceeds is now controlled. In other words, those proceeds need to be aligned with investments that are green. And what are the kinds of things that you can have? Well, there are, there are different use of proceeds. So there might be projects to do with uh, renewable energy. Um, they might have all kinds of direct uh, good, pollution prevention, environmentally sustainable management of living resources, uh, biodiversity improvements, clean transportation, and so forth. So the bond market is a very, very interesting thing because it attracts very large investment. And if you then tie that investment to improvements on land, improvements in energy, improvements in pollution control, you begin to see that the juggernaut of wealth is turning the tide. And it will start to counteract that enormous amount of subsidy that we see, which is really perverse, that's actually taking us off the course where we want to be. There is a subset, which I'm sure some of you may have thought about, which is climate financing. Um, there's carbon markets, there are net zero asset managements, there's all kinds of things that try to really align those big proclamations that we're making about reducing emissions. But I also want to raise a small point, which is often overlooked, and it's about climate voting. Some of you may have shares, and you may go or not go to an annual general meeting. But more and more, those companies are going to have something close to a portfolio, a green portfolio, maybe some of those things we've talked about, the green bonds. And essentially, climate voting is where you can begin to really show, because you ask, what's in the portfolio? 
And then you vote on that, not just on the performance of the company, but on how well they're actually delivering on climate. So we're trying to elevate what we call climate diligence through proxy voting approaches. And it's very important that we really grab hold of the asset owners, the asset managers, and say, we're going to hold you accountable. We're going to vote on the basis of climate, not just on the basis of finance. And that duality is really going to drive home the message that at the end of the day, how people manage money for others, and therefore, in the long term, where does the wealth go, is really part of the beneficiary that is essential for nature and for all of us to survive. Finally, if you look at climate insurance, I mean, this is really becoming incredibly important. There's nearly $30 trillion of assets under management and a huge amount of volume of money moving around in the insurance industry. So th this is not a trivial industry. And again, the leading insurers are really beginning to understand that when they have a net zero insurance alliance coming together, they need to have principles about what they're doing and why they're doing. So this race to zero, which we're hearing about, and you'll hear a lot more about as we go towards Glasgow, is really important because groups are now realizing that this is where it's at. The race for zero really is a race. And whether it's a commercial imperative, a planetary imperative, a social imperative, we're actually all coming onto the same page. But that doesn't mean that people shouldn't be holding companies, insurance agencies, and so on, absolutely to account. We want to see consistency. We want to see transparency. Now, there's no reason why they can't be delivered because a lot of work has gone into this. So it's not just the physical risks related to climate. It's not just the transition risks of going from, renew from non-renewal fossil fuels to renewable energy. But it's all those potential litigation risks that might come along because a company said it was taking care of nature and investing in mangroves, coral reefs, and then there was a massive wipeout. Well, you can see where the finger is pointing. So the insurance industry is now really having to look at how to assess the degradation of nature as well as climate change because they realize that these two are becoming intertwined and the level of risk is going up as they become intertwined. So whether it's insurance, net zero financing, there are opportunities everywhere. And we are genuinely talking about trillions of dollars that is, so to speak, floating around, waiting to find its home. So whether it's banks, insurance agencies, or just individuals, we all have a role to play in making sure that those funds are genuinely um, available for the right kinds of projects. Now, I could talk a lot more about it, but I think at the end of the day, we need to vote with our feet, with our heads, with our hearts. I mean, there's an enormous range of financial products coming onto the market. And the last thing we want is for people to become bamboozled by them all. So in a sense, in education, I'm thinking that even young people, certainly children, need to be educated in what they all mean. What's the difference between a bond and a loan and an investment and all these different things that might come along? But the challenge for all of us is to make sure that these enormous sums of money that are being pushed into investments in climate, in nature projects, that they actually generate the outcomes that we want for the future that we want, not just um, a random set of outcomes that might help a local person do slightly better. No, we need to connect all of this together. We need our collective and our individual voting rights because the planet belongs to all of us, and we actually need to vote for the planet, not just for individual actions. So thank you very much, and I'm going to hand over for some Q&A, and hopefully we've got some already. Uh, thank you so much, Professor McGlade. Uh, we do have quite a few questions through from the audience. And the first one I've got here is, how can we work out what banks are doing with our money? Well, the first thing is to make sure that you can even walk into your local branch and ask your bank manager, write an email, ask them. Because at the level that we're operating, at transparency level, they should be able to give you an answer. But there are some good places to go. In the, in the lecture notes, you'll see something called um, the good banking principles, the green banking principles. And there are a whole series, 200 banking institutions that have signed up, some of them high street banks. So you'll be able to see if your bank is one of them. If it's not, I'd go ask them why they haven't joined. 
The second question I've got here is, how can I invest in nature by volunteering? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Because, in effect, it speaks to the wealth that we all have. And there are many, many projects. What I think is very good is to go to uh, an organisation like the Wildlife Trusts. They have connected up all of the different activities, for example, across England, um, and they are, and, and Wales and other places, so an equivalent of a wildlife trust that are really understanding the bigger picture and being able to see how smaller volunteering actions can fit in. But, as we see in, in the DEFRA programme, there's a way to have local stewardship funded. So your volunteering might be to design a local project which will really help nature to thrive. Another question here about uh, the concept of investing in nature. I feel the concept is a very difficult one for politicians to understand. Have you any ideas how they might be helped? That's, <laughs> yes, very good. So I spoke a lot about um, the failure of institutions and, and the political system we have is just one part of that institutional landscape. Again, I think that people and money speaks, no doubt about it. But I think politicians are coming around to, um, it's a bit like reputational branding. If they're not investing in nature, the question is, why not? Because what's good for nature is good for the economy, and there's, no, there's nothing between it. So clearly, if they're not investing in nature, they're not actually investing in the economy or, the, or society at large. So I think that's where we have to place them right in the center and say, if you're not investing in nature, you're not investing in us. Is it possible that the capitalist business model, production for profit and end <coughs> endless economic growth, um, has been the cause of the problem? Fundamentally, economic growth that has got out of control it is really the problem. And so what I would say is there is a space absolutely for commercial viability, but not at the expense of demand and supply being completely out of kilter. And so, again, we should be putting pressure on supply chains. We should be putting pressure on those, uh, those companies that have supply chains where, we, where they don't really know the damage or the impact that they're having. So there is a place, but it's, probably not ad it's definitely not ad infinitum. And it's definitely where there has to be a reinvestment in nature as they take it out. Um, there's a question here about the Pope's encyclical uh, Laudato Si, asking, has it influenced your position? I am truly impressed by how this Pope has been able to grasp many of the different and difficult topics, whether it's climate change or um, human place uh, within nature and so forth. But you notice that one of the recommendations from the Dasgupta report still comes back to population growth. And so we have to square this off, what the planet can sustain in terms of numbers of people and how we live. And we might end up with something that some from outside might call a frugal economy, where everybody has to do with a little bit less, but it's a sustainable future. So on the whole, yes, I think he writes with great wisdom and, and great inspiration. Um, there's a question here about putting a price tag on everything so as to trade competitively. Is that the root of the problem, for example, of overfishing? Uh, sadly, that's not the case because we don't put a proper price on anything. In fact, markets have failed us because we have not properly costed those externalities. Would that the price of the damage had been put in to, let's say, the price of a, a cod fillet, but that absolutely isn't the case. So I think that the market failure and the pricing is sort of secondary to this fundamental issue of we didn't really cost and take account of the damage and as a result, we've got a very, very poor instrument called the market, called profitability, that's really, in a sense, just subsidizing the damage. So we need to go back to basics. And I'm not saying we have to value everything, many things we would just like to leave as they are. But that, in a sense, requires us to understand their value, their worth to society. And whether or not you do it in dollar terms, people's well-being terms, um, there are many ways that we can actually value something. Um, how can we challenge local authorities to value development proposals in terms of environmental costs and not just economic benefits? I can see a trend uh, in quite a lot of decision-making today around social good, 
What we need to do is to challenge it so that it's actually got environmental and social good and sustainability all together. So we shouldn't be thinking just about environmental impact assessments anymore. We need to think about this broader package of how we deliver public goods, whether it's housing, whether it's a new roadway. Um, and it, it is very, very important that people get engaged with local authorities because in many, center, in many situations, they are where the money is spent that affects people most brutally in some cases and most directly. So it's not easy for local authorities, but I think today, if one was to ask are they going in the right direction? There's a genuine effort to do the right thing. Social inequality is making absolutely playing havoc with how we, you know, we, we can see local resources being spent. But it shouldn't be at the expense of nature. So there's a challenge there, but certainly it's one I think that many local authorities are struggling with and would probably welcome the kind of debate perhaps that you know, this might have triggered so people can come with more authority about what they expect to see. I've got a question here about models. What models can we use to evaluate cost? How can we improve whole life, life cost analysis, for example? Well, if I was in the actuarial business, I'd be telling you that the way we're running the planet today is really not doing us any good because we're um, actually foreshortening our lives because of the kinds of risks that we're opening ourselves up to. When we think about costs per se and how we can evaluate those over, the, over our lifetime, then we have to bring in a lot of non-monetary side. So if you live in a, a, let's say, in a community where, let's say, very poor, nevertheless, maybe even less than a dollar a day kind of setting, but where the community helps and supports each other, that is wealth in itself. So I think costing and understanding that goes back very much to the way in which social capital is also put onto the spreadsheet alongside of what currently is called natural capital. And for me, it's really important that we understand those two because you can substitute economic capital, finance in other words, with both natural and social capital. And that's the triangle that we need to try and keep in our minds all the time. Um. Uh, Professor McGlade, um, thank you so much um, for the lecture. This is the last one in your yeah. current series. Um, but everyone who's attended tonight um, will be sending you a link to the video and transcript in a couple of days' time. But if you sign up to our mailing list on the website, uh, we'll be able to tell you about Professor McGlade's next series of lectures starting this autumn on natural capital and the well-being economy. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure to be with you. Thank you.